Hey guys, and welcome to another video. I'm Maggie, a professional. I'm Maggie, a professional MCAT tutor, and today we're going to be going over the AAMC Practice Exam 1, Passage 2 of the BB section. So let's get right into it. So first things first, obviously, let's go ahead and read the passage and then flowchart it. Again, if you haven't seen John's video on flowcharting, it's great and I highly recommend that you watch it and we'll link it above. All right, let's get into this. Malnutrition is known to increase susceptibility to colitis or colon inflammation. Colitis can also be caused by pellagra, a condition that may result from tryptophan deficiency and heart nut disease, a condition resulting from decreased function of the small intestinal neutral amino acid transporter AT1, the latter of which reduces gut absorption of tryptophan, the plasma membrane embedded domain of the angiotensin 1 converting enzyme 2 ACE2 is necessary for AT1 localization to the luminal plasma membrane of small intestinal epithelial cells. AC1 simultaneously transports tryptophan against its concentration gradient and a sodium ion along its concentration gradient into the cytoplasm of intestinal epithelial cells. To determine how malnutrition promotes colitis, researchers treated wild-type mice and mice with loss of function mutations in the X-linked ACE2 gene with dextran sodium sulfate DSS, which increases colitis susceptibility by damaging intestinal epithelial cells. Mice were then fed one of the three diets below. Standard diet, protein-free diet, or glycine tryptophan, a dipeptide not requiring AT1 for intestinal uptake. Mice were then monitored for weight loss as an indicator of colitis. Then we're given table one. A little bit of figure interpretation here. We see that it's the effects of the ACE2 genotype and the diet on colitis and circulating tryptophan. So basically, you know, what this entire passage was about. Um, let's look at some of the big numbers here. It looks like, um, you know, percent weight loss four days after the start of the DSS treatment. So a higher percent weight loss would mean obviously more weight was lost. So it looks like the the mice on the protein-free diet, uh, whether or not they had this ACE2 genotype mutant, it looks like if they don't have protein in their diet, they lose a lot of weight. Um, it looks like feeding them the, the glycine tryptophan diet plus the standard diet was pretty protective of this um, because it doesn't require that transporter, right? So now that we've flow charted, done a little bit of figure interpretation, and we kind of know what this passage is about, let's get into the questions. Question one says, which amino acid, in addition to tryptophan, is most likely to be transported by AT1? Well, let's go back up in the passage just a little bit to see exactly what AT1 is. You know, we know that it's some sort of transporter, maybe a transmembrane protein, but let's look back in the passage to see if we can get any hints. All right, so we see up in the first paragraph, it says um, that heart and up disease is a condition resulting from decreased function of the small intestinal neutral amino acid transporter AT1. There's our huge hint right there. It's a neutral amino acid transporter. Let's see if that's enough to mark out all the other answer choices. So our answer choices are phenylalanine. That is a neutral amino acid. It's also aromatic which is very similar to tryptophan, so I'm really liking that answer. Um, B says lysine. Lysine is a basic amino acid. It has a positive charge on it, um, so it's probably not the right answer. Arginine um, is also a charged amino acid. It um, is a basic amino acid. Again, positive charge. Glutamate is actually, um, you know, glutamic acid, glutamate, same thing. It's also charged. It's an acidic amino acid, so that's not going to be our right answer. So phenylalanine is the correct answer because it is a neutral amino acid and also it is very similar to tryptophan in its structure, in its side chain. It, they're both aromatic. So phenylalanine is going to be our correct answer there. 
Question two says, based on the information in the passage, a mature AT1 mRNA is most likely to contain a sequence coding for which genetic factors? All right, so when I read this question, we just talked a little bit in question one about exactly what AT1 was. And it's, a, it's an amino acid transporter, right, for neutral amino acids. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking transmembrane protein, something like that. So now let's simplify this question a little bit. A mature AT1 mRNA is most likely to contain a sequence coding for which genetic factors. So basically, what does mature mRNA code for? A says signal sequence. Going through this the first time when I first took this test, I would not have known what a signal sequence was. I got enough questions wrong about signal sequences to where I finally made a card and put it in my misconcepts deck. But even if you didn't know it, um, or you didn't know what a signal sequence was, you could still get this answer choice right. So a signal sequence, um, I'm gonna put a maybe beside it because I'm assuming that at this point, I didn't know what a signal sequence was. All right, introns. We know that mature mRNA does not code for introns. Mature mRNA is when the introns are already cut out, they're spliced out, however you wanna say it, and they're thrown out, okay? Exons expressed, exons are the ones that are in mature mRNA. So that's not gonna be correct. Again, promoters, um, they're not coded for by mature mRNA, so that's out as well. And then D says a nuclear localization signal. So what a nuclear localization signal is, is a part of your mRNA that tells um, your protein or whatever it is to localize to the nucleus, to go to the nucleus. We know that AT1 is actually on the outside. It's, it says that ACE2 is necessary for AT1 localization to the luminal plasma membrane of small intestinal epithelial cells, blah, blah, blah. Basically, it goes to the outside. It doesn't stay in the nucleus. It doesn't stay in the cytoplasm anywhere else. It goes to the plasma membrane. It stays on the outside. Transmembrane kind of protein we got going on here. So definitely we're not gonna be localizing to the nucleus. Signal sequence is the only one that's left and it's probably the correct answer. And I can tell you now, knowing what a signal sequence is, which a signal sequence is a portion of your mRNA that tells the ribosome to locate to the um, endoplasmic reticulum so that when the protein kind of gets pumped out of the ribosome, it can go into the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, make its way to the Golgi body and then it can get um, kind of pushed out to the outside, you know, exocytosed to the plasma membrane. That's kind of how transmembrane proteins get there. Um, and that's how signal sequences work to make that happen. So signal sequence is the correct answer. Question three says, which effect did a protein free diet have on DSS treated uh, positive and negative mice respectively? So we talked a little bit about this in the figure interpretation, right? So we already have a good idea of what a protein-free diet, how that affected the mice. I had no clue that this question was coming up. You know, I took this test, but I took this, you know, almost a year ago. Um, so I had no clue that this was coming up when I did the figure interpretation. I just saw that huge percent weight loss and I was like, maybe they'll ask a question on that because that's a pretty big result, right? Um, so we know that both the positive and the negative mice lost weight with that protein-free diet. You know, they were, they were malnourished, they had colitis, whatever you want to say. But D is the one, is the answer choice that uh, puts that into words. All right, next question says, pellagra also results from a deficiency of nicotinamide. Isn't that that stuff in the ordinary? I think I have that in my, in my closet. Um, which is synthesized from tryptophan. Nicotinamide nucleotides are neither oxidized nor reduced during which step of cellular respiration? If you paid attention um, in biology, you might have noticed that what nicotinamide is, um, you know, most commonly in our cells is NAD and NADH, or NAD plus and NADH. Nicotinamide 
adenine dinucleotide. <laughs> That's NAD and then NADH is when it's protonated. I didn't know that the first time going through this test and I'm gonna show you how you can answer it without knowing that. But if you wanna put that in your pocket, it might help for the future. So we're trying to figure out when is this nicotinamide nucleotide oxidized or reduced? Of course, I know nothing about this molecule, um, but I know that I'm looking at some of the steps of cellular respiration. So let's kind of mark out um, a couple answer choices that maybe we can get without knowing exactly what nicotinamide is. So A is glycolysis. Um, you know, there are things that are oxidized and reduced within glycolysis. And so I'm not sure at this point if nicotinamide is or not, because remember, I'm, I'm pretending like I don't know that it's NAD or NADH. Um, so I don't know. B says chemiosmosis. All right. Well, that's that's a red flag for me because chemiosmosis is, is mostly thought of as that movement across membranes. Um, you know, of molecules or chemicals. And in this case, we're talking about cellular respiration. That's kind of like mostly talking about the protons kind of coming through the ATP synthase and, and coupling that to um, literal ATP synthesis. So in that case, nothing is oxidized or reduced. You know, I don't know if nicotinamide specifically is oxidized or reduced in glycolysis, in the citric acid cycle, or the electron transport chain, but I know that there are things that are oxidized or reduced within those three. I know that there's nothing oxidized or reduced in chemiosmosis. So um, in that case, I'm really leaning towards that answer choice. Um, I kind of already covered C and D, the citric acid cycle and the ETC. Um, both of those have things oxidized or reduced within them, specifically NAD. Um, and so I'm liking B. I'm going to click B. I'm going to choose answer choice B. If you had known that when they were saying nicotinamide, they meant NAD or NADH, that would have been really helpful to answer this question. So maybe know that. But I just want to be honest and tell y'all exactly what I was thinking when I went through this test the first time. So B is how I got the correct answer, not knowing that it was in A. The last question says, if a man with a mutant copy of ACE2 has a child with a woman that is heterozygous for the mutant ACE2 allele, what is the probability that the child will be a female and homozygous for the mutant ACE2 allele? So this is like a Punnett square type question, but it's also like a... A probability type question we have to know how to calculate ands you know there's ands and then there's ors I think is the other one so let's see let's um, let's decide what's the probability that this child is gonna have the mutant ace 2 um, or be homozygous for it and then we can decide what's the probability that they will be a female and then we can multiply them okay so let's do a Punnett square I always recommend guys Please always do a Punnett square. You will get these easy questions wrong if you don't do a Punnett square. Um, and then I'm just going to choose a random letter. Um, I'll choose T. It says, so this man has a mutant copy of ACE2. So that means um, if he literally has the mutant copy of the protein or the gene, then he's homozygous for it. Whoops. He's homozygous for it. And then the woman is heterozygous for it. You know, I'm assuming that this mutant copy is a is a recessive gene. Okay, so let's fill out this Punnett square. So it looks like the child has a 50% chance of being homozygous for the mutant ACE2 allele, which is what we're looking for. But we also need the child to be a female. So let's just do a quick um, like germ cell, though this looks so bad. Okay, so the child is also has a 50% chance of being a female. So when you do uh, questions that are asking the probability of one thing to happen and another thing to happen at the same time, Obviously, that's more rare than just one or the other happening for both of them to happen. So we're going to be multiplying 
you know, 50% times 50% or 0.5 times 0.5. And what do you get when you do that? You get 0.25 or 25%. So the answer there is going to be B. That's how you figure out all of those probability questions. Um, if it's an or question, then you add uh, the two probabilities, but that's something for your content guide to cover, not necessarily me. I hope you guys have learned something from this passage. I hope you've learned more about how to flow chart, simplify the question stem, and then get things right when you don't necessarily know all the information. I know I didn't know everything going through uh, this passage the first time, so I'm trying to keep it real with you guys and show you how I actually answered it. If there's any other kinds of passages that you want me or John to cover, uh, please comment them down below. We're open to doing all kinds of passage practice, but until then, you should probably go study. All right. Bye-bye. And like and subscribe, please.